this. There we go. Hi. Hi. Good morning. Morning. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Well, for my followers that don't know, my name is Kylie Myers. I'm Miss Rodeo, Oklahoma. I have a podcast, and that's what we're here doing today. And um, we're kind of going to do some dual stuff and launch with this video podcast with Clint here. But this is Clint with C Bar H Saddlery in Yukon, Oklahoma, and I'm so excited to visit with you. Today. Yeah, it's nice to have you here in the shop this morning. Um, uh, like Kylie said, my name is uh, my name is Clint. I go by Doc uh, here at C Bar H Saddlery in Yukon, and. Uh, uh, we're gonna, like, like Kylie said, we're gonna take a take a chance to uh, kind of do something a little bit different together, and and uh, we're gonna launch this her her podcast and this video blog at the same time, and kind of go from there. So anyway, I'll let you start. Yeah, new times call for new age and new things. New so. new new way to do things, <laughs> right? Right. Yes. How did you get into saddle making, and what brought all that on? Okay, so a little bit of history on me is I I rodeo pretty heavy back when I was in my early twenties. Uh, teens, late teens, early twenties in uh, Kansas, and and down through the uh, Central Plains Rodeo Association, um, and uh, I kind of picked up a little bit of of uh, wanting to do this kind of thing back then, and I, I did a few things for myself, and occasionally I did a few things for my buddies, and just kind of played a little bit for the most part, and I've always been kind of a <clears throat> into working with my hands and doing art type things and and that kind of thing so and and I enjoy building you know taking things apart putting them back together and and that kind of thing and so that's kind of how I got I kind of kind of got started there but I never really did a whole lot with it until I got uh, a little bit older and uh, back in the late 90s I, I uh, became a, a farrier and started shoeing horses and I did that for about Oh, between somewhere between uh, pretty heavy for about 10 years on and off another five after that. So um, until my wife and I got married and then uh, back in 2007, I finally got to a point where I was tired of bending over six and seven days a week under a horse. And it was just getting too hard on me physically, especially after all the rodeo wrecks that I've had and that kind of thing. So <laughs> we uh, yeah, we all know about that. That's right. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> I, I just, I, uh, my, my grandparents had passed it uh, by that time. Uh, my grandmother passed a, a year or so before and uh, I ended up with some inheritance money and I decided to go down to, I uh, found this old gentleman down in South Texas and decided to go to his shop and learn how to build a saddle. So uh, went down there and built my own, my first saddle in his shop and really got to know him and, and uh, he, his name was Don Atkinson. Don was uh, Don was big into rodeo from the time he was, you know, a young man up until he was, you know, uh, in, in the mid mid part of his life. And uh, he uh, he got started in a saddle shop when he was ten and and uh, built saddles and boots for years. And I believe uh, he passed away in, if I remember right, 2011. So. Um, so uh, after I left his shop, I came back here and started to work in the garage at the house and did that for two years. Opened my first shop over here on Main Street in Yukon, a uh, little bitty shop, 13 wide by 60 foot deep. And in two years, we outgrew it and uh, I had a little bit of struggle there getting things going at first. I had a really bad horse accident in 2009, <clears throat> uh, right after we opened the shop. and. Uh, Went through a pretty rough period. Uh, I broke my neck and uh, it, and had some other nerve damage type things uh, down my left arm and hand. And, and uh, I spent after a, after a surgery and uh, several months worth of physical therapy, I finally could raise my arm up over my head again and use my left hand. And I'm left-handed, so I still do all this work, you know, that I do with this injured hand and I can still, and it's kind of therapy for me. So I just, it keeps me going. But anyway, and then, uh, back in 2011, then, um, the year Don passed away, we outgrew that little shop and moved over here into the plaza, just a, a shopping center here in Yukon, just, uh, in the shadow of the mill. Uh, in, uh, July, I think. Anyway, um, and we've been here ever since, and we went from a little 600 square foot shop to a you know 1,770 square foot shop. So, uh, 
basically, uh, you know, it's just a mom and pop shop, pretty much me. Uh, I do have an older gentleman that comes in occasionally, helps me do some uh, some braiding and knot tying work that I don't have time to do. And then I got my uncle that uh, uh, came to live uh, around the corner from, from us here in town um, uh, uh, about six six or so years ago. And he kind of, I just give him a place to be, you know, kind of hang out. And so it's kind of a family affair for the most part. We just uh, do our thing, so. It. those are the best um i wanted to ask you i saw on facebook i've been seeing you've been doing some really cool stuff with your house and your countertops oh, yeah. Looks like yeah. Fun. <laughs> uh, yeah that's something a little bit different um yeah and uh so in 2013 everybody knows that we had a big tornado out here in in el reno and uh, as of as of the other day it was kind of funny i actually you, you, you mentioned that i googled the other day the largest uh tornado on record and it brought up the uh 2013 may 31st 2013 tornado here yes. in el reno and we had just moved out to that house or that property <clears throat> and the property at the time was owned by my brother-in-law and we were in the process going to be in the process of purchasing the the, the part of the, the you know property from him and uh that he had out there and uh we moved in and it had been a couple of weeks and we got wiped out so there was no place to live and no house. We lost everything in the house. Everything was gone. And so we, uh, about three years ago, we ended up purchasing a house actually in Stillwater, believe it or not, and had a house mover pick it up and move it 105 miles over to our property. And for the last few years, we've been in the process of re, uh, we've been in the process of, of, you know, redoing a bunch of stuff in the house and kind of getting it ready for us to live in. And, uh, we do most of the work ourselves. We've got the ability and 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 thing to do it. So we're just taking our time and doesn't hasn't always gone the way as fast as we'd like to. But uh, as, so especially recently. So anyway, um, one of the things that I did is here a while back I saw a uh, <clears throat> I, I saw somebody about a year ago, a friend of mine that had tagged this post in Facebook and they had said that uh, they had seen this and they wanted me to look at it. So I go and look at it and there's this guy and he was doing this. Uh, I think he's somewhere in Montana, and I don't remember his name. And and anyway, did I wouldn't necessarily mention, but uh, uh, but anyway, he had done these countertops, I guess, in his house, and uh, covered them in leather, and then and then uh, tooled them, and then uh, poured uh, acrylic epoxy over it. And I looked at it, and I thought, you know, that's a really cool idea, but I see some issues, and and uh, I thought, you know, maybe there's a way to do that a little bit differently and uh, get a better result. So I saw that and I worked on it for a while and I ended up doing some really cool uh, tooled uh, leather countertops for my house. And it was about 20 square feet worth of uh, work, all floral. And uh, for those of you who would like to, uh, who are listening, gonna listen to this and like to see it, they can go to my Facebook, uh, Clinton M. Hole, or they can go to C-Bar H. Sadlery page and they ought to be able to see those countertops uh, uh, posted, pictures or video even, uh, of those countertops posted on uh, either one of those pages. So uh, anyway, um, so I did these really cool counter, uh, tooled countertops and they turned out really awesome. Uh, a lot better than I'd expected. And uh, the epoxy that I used on them is a uh, commercial grade epoxy. It's not just the cheap stuff that you can buy at the local craft store or whatever. It's really expensive stuff. So uh, I paid about a hundred bucks a gallon for it, my, my cost. And, uh, but anyway, it turned out really neat and I got some really cool countertops for my house. So it, it turned out really well, but I do all my own artwork and I do all my own carving and, and, uh, tooling and everything on those. So it turned out really good. It turned out really good. I was impressed. I shared those a lot with a lot of different friends and stuff. And, and I thank you. I cool. thank you for that because I had, I, I think I had, uh, if I remember right, I had about, 1.3 million independent views of those, of those countertops uh, uh, over about two or three posts. So it was pretty, it was pretty impressive. Uh, several people said, oh, I'd love to have those and all kinds of, uh, yeah, all kinds of comments. And, you know, I've even had some people call me or uh, contact me privately and say how much would it cost to do this or that. And we've talked, so maybe we'll see. We may get some uh, business out of it. I think uh, one, uh, customer, potential customer uh, from uh, uh, have a, has a lodge somewhere over in Arizona and up in the 
high country there in Arizona, and they were talking about having me come and maybe doing a fancy bar top for them for their lodge. So we'll see how that turns out. But for sure. Be kind of cool. I know you got your start in rodeo, and as did I, and before I started rodeoing and brow racing all the time, I was drill teaming, mm -hmm. and that started with 4-H, and I know that 4-H is really big into safety and getting things started from the ground up. We always emphasize, you know, you know how to take care of your horse before you're allowed to get on your horse, and safety, and I know you're big on equipment safety. I'm very big on equipment safety. I'm, a, I'm very big on safety, period, simply because of the accident that I had. Um, uh, the, and the accident that I had had nothing to do necessarily with equipment safety, but uh, just safety uh, when around uh, horses in general, because they are a <clears throat> prey animal, and we are predators in their in their eyes, and we have to uh, establish that symbiotic relationship between you know uh, predator and prey in order to gain their trust. So um, uh, since I got hurt my big thing was uh making sure kids uh one of the things i want to make sure through through my shop and through education and just talking to people and parents and different people that come in is to educate them on the safety of their equipment and the the, the number one thing is for me uh, from my aspect of it is i compete for my business with uh, a very large industry of what we call uh, production built saddles and often in in the production built saddle industry one of the biggest things is that uh, these different companies <clears throat> purchase their materials in bulk for as cheaply as they can because they want to make as much return as they can and I understand that because I do the same thing however they also sometimes employ or uh, uh, building practices where they cut corners. They, not only do they buy cheap because they wanna make uh, uh, you know, as much money as they can, but they buy too cheap and the quality of the materials subpar. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is, is you have in the, in the industry, that industry, they've got you know, 20, 30 people building uh, having their hands and building one saddle, whereas in my shop, I'm I'm the guy. I build from beginning to end, and I have control of all the quality control from beginning to end. So uh, I get I get pretty uh, I I, st I try to stay on top of my quality control when it comes to making sure that my product's safe when it leaves. Often in the in the production saddle industry, uh, you see uh, see saddles that are just not worth in my opinion uh, and this is just an opinion and many like myself would share that opinion that you see saddles that aren't worth what they need to be worth when they leave their shops and uh, it's all about money it's not about necessarily safety so you have to be on top of uh, what you buy when you're talking about production built saddles uh, there are a few companies out there that build pretty decent saddles that are production type companies and, and that kind of thing and, and uh, you know and I understand not everybody's got the kind of money that it takes to come into my shop and buy a saddle from me because my saddles start twice as much as what most of those do so um, and, and, and again that's understandable so uh, you know custom built saddles aren't for everybody but when you get custom you it's a it's an investment it's not just a, it, it's not just a purchase you know it'll get, this I'm gonna buy this because it'll get me by okay. or or whatever uh, people need to get kind of away from that mentality especially when they're talking about safety uh, because when you start buying because that's it'll get me by is when you start compromising safety and so uh, my biggest thing is to make sure that you don't buy too cheap okay because too cheap often means a lack of quality, a lack of safety, which translates into a lack of safety. Uh, make sure that the saddles that you're that you're purchasing are of good quality materials. Uh, you know, the saddle itself, the parts and pieces aren't really too soft and fleshy, where they cut you know maybe the piece out of a out of the belly of the hide rather than the you know the the more substantial part of the hide where it the piece of of uh, the the part of the saddle actually wears a lot longer, uh, especially when it comes to the riggings. The rigging is the part of the saddle that holds 
that helps hold the the saddle to the horse but it also holds the tree to the pieces so of the saddle so that it all stays together so the main thing is is you know your rigging pieces are good made out of good quality leather you know your your hardware is of good quality steel or metal uh preferably stainless uh your latigo straps and your billet straps your offside billet straps are all made out of really good uh, materials so that uh, they don't pop loose and um you know come apart whenever you're riding and possibly get dumped or hit the ground and maybe break a bone or whatever so uh or bust your head or break your neck or, or so anyway we, we just really don't want that to happen the other side of that is once you are able to look and purchase uh for and purchase something that is of a better quality um or of good quality what you really want to do is you need to make sure that you do regular checks of your equipment so um you know if you if you ride quite a bit and your horse sweats one of the worst things for leather is salty sweat and then drying out and it's much like untreated wood leather is when you don't quench it clean it retreat it uh you know uh oil it up and and condition the leather and keep it clean and whatever it tends to start cracking and fails and eventually you get latigos that pop and different things that come apart so anyway uh uh safety check your equipment on a regular basis wipe it down if you're out all the time you know uh, quite a bit where your horse is sweating and and it's sweating on the leather and latigo straps and the backs of the fenders and the uh, stirrup leathers and that kind of thing wipe those down and about you know three or four times a year give them a little bit of oil give them a little bit of leather conditioner you know and do the things that you need to do to keep them nice uh, wipe the whole saddle down even uh, i know some people they get out in arenas where they get a lot of dirt and dust and everything and the dirt and dust gets down on all that pretty tooling and then it gets dirty and it looks nasty and you know uh, there's nothing worse than getting moisture then in that dirt and the dirt collects the moisture it holds it and then it it does the same thing it kind of starts breaking the leather down so after a while you really need to just make sure that you you get things cleaned and uh, uh on a regular basis just make sure your your equipment's in good shape um <clears throat> and then if you want to uh and you don't necessarily have time to do a real deep clean you can send it to a person like myself or find a saddle shop that you can with a you know trusted person that, that you can take it to and have that really good deep clean take it take the strip the saddle down take it apart and you know really get down into the nooks and crannies and everything and clean it up oil it up condition it make sure everything safety check it make sure everything's up to speed your rigging leathers are good your latigo leathers are good your back sense your billet straps your you know your sense connector all that kind of stuff all the lace the lacing on your billet straps are all good and everything is really good because if the lacing on your billet straps are are uh are going bad most likely you could pop a billet strap next thing you know you got the back sense dangling under the horse and you got a big problem maybe a big wreck and who knows so anyway i, I really hate to see uh kids get hurt because their equipment's not up to speed so uh one thing that i would uh I would caution people about some of these production saddles is there's a particular, um, if they're saddles, as a general rule, if they're saddle brands that you've heard of before, most likely you could probably trust them. If they're saddles that are off brands and you've never really heard of them, most likely they're imported. And in many cases, uh, and I've seen this over and over in my saddle shop, uh, I've got one in here now, as a matter of fact, um, that uh, somebody bought this saddle brand new for $250. It came from India overseas, they're imported, and they are absolute junk, stay away from them. Don't buy a $250 brand new saddle, it's not worth it. Uh, I always ask people, uh, the trees are hollow, <laughs> there's no wood underneath, there's no nothing, and they've got leather that you're supposed to keep on a thousand pound animal uh you know stuck to this tree and there's literally nothing holding it but air so it's uh they're just not worth buying and they're dangerous to begin with i would caution people just to absolutely do not buy them i see them in here all the time i see all kinds of even name brands unfortunately and i there's 
too many of them to to really uh, <clears throat> mention at the point, but I've seen several name brands that uh, once I've torn them down and cleaned them, checked them and everything, I wouldn't own it. I just, I just wouldn't own it. Uh, I, I would suggest that other people don't own them either, simply because if you saw what I saw, and I see this every day, this is my job, uh, I would absolutely just cringe to think what could happen if uh, somebody got hurt. Uh, there's a lot of companies out there that, again, are just out for the dollar, not out for the quality. So do your research. Absolutely, do your <laughs> research. And if you don't know, find somebody like myself that does know and ask them, have them help you. Even if you're looking for a used saddle and they can't afford to buy one of yours, somebody surely, you know, out there like myself is gonna be there to say, hey, you know, we got this saddle, you know, uh, the best way to do it is, you know, will they let you take it for a little bit and check it out and make sure it's safe and everything's fine before you buy it, if it's used. And if you like it, you know, then you can purchase it, whatever. Maybe your saddle guy will, or your tack guy will sign off on it and say, yeah, it's, it looks to be in pretty good shape, you know, that kind of thing. So do that before you really spend a lot of money. But there are some good used saddles out there that are reasonable for the price. So, you know, just understand, I, I, I get, you know, in, in a perfect world, I'd love everybody to come to me and get and get what they, what, what they uh, can get from me. But I just uh, financially understand that that's just not feasible for everybody. Uh, again, I wish they could, because it sure would make my job, my, my, my life, uh, it, in some ways it would make it a lot better and in some ways it wouldn't, but because then I'd be busy all the time, wouldn't have as much time to spend with my family, but maybe I could hire somebody to help me. So anyway, uh, just do your research and make sure that, uh, everything's on the up and up and, uh, and, and that kind of thing. So. Speak of family, I know you've got a little girl at home. Mm -hmm. When are you going to start building her first saddle? Well, I keep <laughs> telling people, <laughs> yeah, we just had her. We just had her on the third uh, of June. She was born on the third of June. She was supposed to be Mama's. We were supposed to induce on the seventh, and Mama's supposed to have her on the eighth. But she came early and decided that she was going to show up. So um, I keep I keep teasing. Uh, uh, the idea uh, with people when they come in and talk about the baby, uh, I say, uh, uh, you know, I'm probably going to build her a saddle before she's old enough uh, to ride uh, her first saddle, and she's probably going to build her first saddle before she's old enough to drive. So, <laughs> there you go. Because she's going to grow up in this shop whether she likes it or not. Uh, yep. That's that's how this is going to work. Uh, once she's old enough to do and understand things, she's going to be in the shop with daddy. And especially the way things are going, you know, Mama and I have talked recently, even before we had her, uh, you know, we've talked about the possibility of, for the first few years of life anyway, to homeschool her, mm -hmm. um, especially with the way things have been going now, <laughs> that might not be such a bad idea. But if we're going to homeschool her, there's no reason why she can't be over on the computer here in the shop while I'm working and she grows up and sees how things go in here. And, and uh, mm -hmm. Maybe it won't say "and sons" on the on the window, but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know maybe she'll be able to to uh, possibly get that same passion that I have for for building and uh, making sure people have what they really need and want uh, well, down the road. So we'll now see. I think the general rule of thumb in the Western industry, no matter if you're in saddle making or ranching or question anything we've just kind of have this lifestyle mm -hmm. of growing up and understanding the value of hard work and the dollar and no matter what aspect you're in I think it's just really hard to find these days and I've you know I've been around a lot I went to a city school I was not grown up in a rural community and it's I, hard to find I'm the, the, I'm the same way believe it or not uh, it's funny you say that uh, my daddy was a uh, my mama was a, a, a nurse and my dad was a minister pastor so uh, I didn't grow up on the farm either, but uh, I did, in some respects, get that. Uh, uh, we spent a lot of time in Indiana because that's where most of my family's from and uh, at grandma's house and grandma was on farm. Mm -hmm. So we were at grandma's house quite a bit on uh, mom's mom. Uh, we were at grandma's house quite a bit and I spent a lot of time out on the farm doing farm kid stuff and and that kind of thing and every chance I got and my other grandmother my dad's mom she just lived you know 25 30 minutes away in the city so 
we'd go over there and see Grandma Hole in, in, in town, and I'd go over to the park across the street and play and, and whatever and have a good time, and that'd get old, and I'd want to go back to Grandma Dorothy's house out in the country. So Grandma Hole kind of got the short end of the stick a lot of times because I just didn't like it in the city. It just, uh, just wasn't my thing. So um, I, you know, I, I, totally, I totally get uh, you know, it's this agrarian background that we grow up in, a lot of us grow up in. And But here's the other thing. My dad did, uh, was a pastor in some small farming and ranching type communities. Like we, I was born in Fairview, Oklahoma. So Fairview's this little tight knit ranch community. And dad used to go to the sale barn every, every week and go to the sale and watch the sale and hang out and everybody, you know, and, uh, you know, he always kid. It was kind of funny. He, 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 uh, my dad could joke and tease with the best. And, uh, he, he always told those guys and a bunch of those farmers and ranchers that he was the best bull shipper there ever was in, in, uh, major county. So it was pretty funny. He, he was, uh, uh, he could pretty lay it on pretty thick, but, uh, but, you know, I had a lot of friends growing up that were ranch farm kids and stuff. And, then uh, we moved down to Poto, Oklahoma, which is another little uh, small, you know, farm, small. Small, <laughs> farm, yeah, farm and ranching type community down in southeastern Oklahoma. And then we moved from there up to Newton, Kansas, which is also a, a small farming ranching community and several farm and ranching communities around there. You know, Heston uh, is a big one, uh, you know, because back in the day, whenever the national finals was here in, in uh, Oklahoma City, Heston was one of the major sponsors and Heston Corp and it's just it was just seven miles up the road from Newton so um anyway uh you know I've always been in a uh, small town for the most part small town uh rural America and it's just it this kind of a lifestyle appealed to me more more so than it, it than it did to uh the rest of my family I guess my brother you know he's he's a city he's kind of a city guy he works for the uh U.S. military and my sister, they live in a small town now in Cheney, uh, Kansas, uh, out, you know, farm and ranch community, but she grew up in the city, in Wichita, and had a, you know, bi uh, business jobs, you know, that kind of thing. I just, I've always worked in, you know, more of a construction or some kind of a situation where I was always more around that, that small town type feel, ranch type feel, so just kind of how things worked out for me yep yeah. i am uh, going into nursing and i've been a hospital since i was 18 working so for me um getting to talk to my patients that came from smaller communities and getting to hang out with them was always kind of the highlight of my day because we had a lot of common ground to get to talk mm -hmm. about but i kind of had the best of both worlds i guess i grew up in more so 6a high school yep very city but my grandparents and my dad had land right on the river in southwest Oklahoma City. So being out there, it was 15 minutes from the city, but we had 200 acres. And to get up at 5 o'clock, ride five had of horses before I went to school. There Got kicked go. out of a class for wearing spurs on accident because I hadn't <laughs> taken them off. Yeah. Fun times. <laughs> We we had kids when I was in high school in Newton. Uh, you know, we were a 6A school. We were still kind of a small, small community. Uh, uh, we had kids that came to school with spurs on. Back then, they didn't care. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, I guess, you know, whatever. But uh, yeah. uh, things are things are <laughs> a lot different than they used to be. And, and it's just interesting. But, you know, that's just kind of how it is. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so I want to ask a question of you. Uh, so what made you want to do rodeo pageant so my grandma had me on a horse before i could set up by myself mm. it's kind of like talking about your daughter you know she'll yeah. do things before she's actually able i guess right that's how i was and she did a lot of rodeoing through drill team that's how she got her start she grew up on a dairy farm in arkansas so i decided that i'd go with them to the rodeos watch the drill team stuff and i really liked the barrel racing and the speed aspect so i rodeoed for a while and then in 2006 I got involved in the 4-H drill teaming and went along with that. And through that, I've met some really wonderful people. Um, the Bakers that are actually from yep. Southwest Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. Grandma Betty Baker. Yep. Um, they used to call her the cold caller because she used to call girls in the paper that had done beauty pageants and decided that, hey, you know, you look like you'd make a rodeo queen. Let's teach you how to ride. <laughs> and so right. she said, you can ride. We'll do the other stuff and teach you how to do that. So. 
through Rough. 4-H and speeches, she decided to get me into rodeo queening, and I was the 2009 Miss Rodeo Oklahoma Princess. Took a nice 10-year break from queening. I stayed active in helping volunteer with our organization through the Oklahoma Rodeo Pageants Council. Really loved being behind the scenes. I wasn't so much one that wanted to get back out there, and then as time went on, you know, you grow up, and I realized that maybe that was a platform that I wanted to step back into. I had lived quite a bit of life at that point, you mm -hmm. know, in retrospect of things that I had been through and really wanted to make other people aware that you can use your voice for a mm -hmm. positive aspect and you can do really whatever you want to do. So that's kind of what made me decide that I wanted to run for the Shardy Oklahoma. I gave myself 28 days to get ready for a pageant in the time that I decided I wanted to run and finding a pageant. So it was <laughs> like, I need all new clothes. Let's find a horse. Let's get everything rolling. So it was kind <clears> of a whirlwind, but it's been great ever since. Cool. That's cool. That's, uh, that's a, yeah. Um, I know the Bakers pretty well. I used to go to church with them, um, Ronnie and and his wife, and then you know Callie, and uh, and uh, her sister, older sister Reba. Reba, Reba. Yep. yeah. And I know we I, we supported um, we supported Callie pretty heavy when she was running. So uh, I, I was really glad to see when when uh, when uh, Ronnie's wife. Uh, Karen. Karen. That's yep. it. When Karen, <laughs> when Karen brought you in to my shop first time, that was really nice. Her, I, I, I appreciate uh, her her coming in and and uh, so anyway, yeah. So you know, I wanted to touch on something from earlier when we were talking. Uh, you asked me. We're talking about using your voice, and one of the ways that I use my voice again is to obviously talk about. Um, uh, <clears throat> talk about safety but one of the other aspects to rodeoing that I think is really important that I've come to realize and and this is really this way in just about any sport or any any job or uh, aspiration in life that that people want to uh, achieve that next level of is you have to have the right tools yes and I'm strongly strongly of the opinion that for those people who are uh, in the rodeo world and competing at at state levels national levels and uh, you know whatever uh, pretty much at any level you got to have the right equipment you know I started and it, and it works the same in saddle making and, and, and leather work um, yeah, I started out with just the cheap tools and that kind of thing, and it got me by. But once I started to build my business and grow and do things, I started buying and got to a point where I could afford to. I started buying the nicer equipment, the nicer hand tools, the nicer things. And it makes such a bigger, much bigger difference in the quality of the work that you produce. Uh, not to say that there aren't some good cheap tools that can't produce good quality because you, they, they can, but there are certain tools that just aren't able to do that and you have to have really good tools in order to do it. So no matter how, how, no matter how good your talent is, sometimes you are constricted by the quality of the tools that you use. So uh, that, that also translates over into saddles. Um, so... I would encourage those people who are, and I'm going to go into salesman mode here a little bit. I would encourage people who are really wanting to achieve that next level of competition and rodeo or, or whatever it is that you do, whether it be rodeo or cutting or sorting or reining or whatever it is, roping, uh, barrel racing, mounted shooting is one of the things that I do. And I've been involved with that since about 2001 or so. Um, and done very well at it myself, uh, was I recognized that at some point in my journey from a being, a, like say, uh, from my perspective in competing to be, from a being a beginner or a new mounted shooter to becoming a world champion, I had to change equipment somewhere. I had to find and seek out that equipment that would make things that much easier for me to achieve my goal and so I'm a big proponent of trying to get people to change people's way of thinking saying well 
this old saddle that I've got is gonna carry me all the way through. And I'm not saying it won't, but at some point, uh, you know, people, I think will begin to realize when they really start to pay attention to the signs of what it is that they're able to do, what able it, there is that they're not able to do in achieving their goal and the signs that their horses are giving them um, physically often tell a story. And, uh, you know, uh, many times in the horse industry, whenever you have a saddle that doesn't fit well or quite as well as it should, it really inhibits your ability to be able to do what you wanna achieve. So um, at some point, people need to step up to that next level and, and really think about getting that higher quality equipment in order to achieve, achieve their goal. And I'm not saying they have to come to me to get it. I'd like for them to. <laughs> but there is something to be said about, about custom uh, saddles when it comes, and so, especially with somebody that knows what they're doing, uh, how to fit, what kind of things that you need out of your saddle specifically for the sport that you're competing in. Um, to, that's another thing about production saddles. There's production saddles out there, and yeah, it's been done this way for you know, a lot of these things have been built this way forever. But and but the people building them are just putting a saddle together. They don't understand that this saddle has to function a certain way in order to, for this person who's riding it in this type of an event to achieve their goal. And if they don't build that particular uh, saddle or style of saddle it, it, from a mechanical standpoint with that in mind that saddle just may be what inhibits you from getting where you need to go yeah talking about like stepping up you know growth is never comfortable mm. and when you get comfortable is when you stop growing and so i know like the prca has done a lot of things to help kids come up there's a lot of camps that mm -hmm. they're going to are there anything like saddle makers or do you just kind of do what you did and find one um to go and there are some there are some schools out there there's different uh you know there's different facebook groups but i'm going to tell you right now um for anybody that say wants to get into the understanding a little bit more about saddles maybe you want to start building some saddles or working on saddles and that kind of thing um my best suggestion is, is don't try to do it on your own. You can go out there and you can, you can read and you can get all the info, Google all the information you want to. You can get on that Wayback Machine on the www and look for everything that you can find. But unless you have practical experience, it means nothing. It really, it means nothing. Um, uh, there are people out there that are just extremely talented when it comes to building saddles and they can pick it up real quick and they can build something the first few times and have it come out really, really nice and just like it should be. But I know I, I've, I've had a couple of students come through my shop uh, myself, um, and, and I do, and I will take students on here at the shop. Uh, and I, I do one-on-one -on -one stuff. I don't do, uh, I don't do groups of people. It's not not what I, I really want to do. I don't have time to do that for one thing. Uh, it's real expensive. It was expensive for me to do what I did when I went down to uh, Texas and spent time with Don. But um, practical experience, unless you are right there and having somebody show you and explain to you firsthand how something needs to be why and why, uh, you know, you can sit there and again, like copy a pattern, cut it out, paste it together, glue it up, nail it, screw it, whatever, uh, together, and, and it may it may look okay, it may work okay, uh, and it may not be okay. <laughs> so there's something to be said for that hands-on experience, and that's one of the things that I think we got away from in this world, uh, especially, you know, in the rodeo world. And that's one of the things, that's one of the reasons why I got into what I was doing. I, I wanted to get away from that, you know, cookie cutter uh, production saddle type thing where, you know, everything just looks like, every other saddle looks like every other saddle. And it's, 
it, it it's like when you drive through a suburbia uh oklahoma or you you know united states anywhere just about you drive through suburbia and you see these little communities and you see these houses and every roof line's the same every floor plan's the same every house looks the same it looks like somebody just kind of rubber stamped it and went down through this whole huge neighborhood and every other house just looks like every other house mm -hmm. and uh that's kind of what that's really kind of what production salary has become in this world, in this country, in the world, for the most part. Uh, it's just this rubber stamped, stamped out thing. And that's just, that's just, it, it it's generic. It, it's, it loses its character. It loses its, I mean, every saddle that I build has a piece of me in it. And I always send a piece of my soul with every saddle that goes out. And that saddle's alive. It has a, it has a, it has that little something that just kind of sets it off from everything else that you see. And uh, so the best thing to do is, you know, find somebody, seek somebody out, seek out a, a, a school that you can go where, you know, they may take five to 10 people at a time. Uh, they're, they're, they're out there. And uh, then there are individuals uh, like myself that are out there. So there's plenty of us. A lot of people say, well, saddle making, Saddle makers are a dying breed. No, we're not. Actually, there's, I can name five right now on my hand, on one hand from right around here. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's plenty more uh, that I don't know. Uh, uh, I can name 30 probably almost from around different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. um, and there's more than that because, uh, you know, about a year ago, uh, back in May, we went to uh, the big... Uh, Sheridan Leather Show that they have annually every year in Sheridan, Wyoming. And uh, I guarantee you there was probably uh, over a hundred different saddle makers there while we were there. Now, not all of them entered something in the saddle competitions, but there was there were several people, you know, there and from across the country in Canada uh, that were, were at that event. And, uh, and a few from out of the country. So, Anyway, there's plenty of us out there, and uh, it's not necessarily a dying art or, or a dying breed. You just got to get off the main road, beaten path, fun. Uh, we're out, we're out there, and so I would, I would encourage people who who would who would uh, like to get into saddle making or leather work in general to start seeking those people out. There's plenty of them out there on Facebook. I can, you know, uh, I can name. Uh, you know, five or six of them that I look up to right now. Um, uh, Chuck Storms from Canada, um, Carrie Schwartz from Salmon, Idaho, uh, Troy West from uh, down here in uh, uh, Texas, just across the state line. Uh, let's see, um, John Willemsma from West Cliff, Colorado. Uh, Let's see, who else? Uh, Pedro Padrini, I think he was from, or he used to be in Oregon. I, I'm not sure where Pedro's now. All these guys are from the Traditional Cowboy Arts Association over in the city. That's what I was about to hit on. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> these guys are all a part of a group that have been around for I think about 23 to 25 years, I think over there at the uh, National Western Heritage Museum. And uh, I've had a chance to meet all these guys and um, spent some time uh, with them in different uh, uh, settings. Uh, we had a, about three or four years ago, they had a big uh, symposium, uh, leather uh, art, leather crafter symposium over at the museum. Went there and then uh, uh, Pedro and Troy had a uh, deal a couple of years ago I, over at the museum I went to and we did uh, some tooling, some leather tooling. Uh, you know, and these guys have, they have regular things. And those, the, there's uh, not just saddle makers, but they've got, uh, they've got silversmiths, um, they've got bit and spur makers, silversmiths, saddle makers, and rawhide braiders all in that, in that uh, group. And they do a lot of really cool things over there. And I've tried to be a part of that as much as I can. Um, and most of those guys, you know, they go to these big leather shows and we see them there and whatever, but I've spent some time with these guys. I've, I've got telephone numbers of a few of them. I call them on a regular basis myself and ask questions because I have things that I want to improve on myself. And that's one of the things I'm always trying to do is um, 
improve my own my own skill and and uh, program what we do here in the shop so um i'm always seeking out knowledge knowledge is power True. and uh you can never you can never uh learn it all i nope. guarantee there's I always guarantee, something else <laughs> i guarantee you i guarantee you there's always something else um so those are the guys that i look up to and uh i actually uh have uh, been applied for the last couple of years for their uh they have a uh they have a uh scholarship that they give away every year and i've actually applied for that scholarship the last couple of years I haven't gotten it but at some point you know they keep troy troy keeps telling me uh keep keep applying you'll you'll get it keep applying you'll get it so we'll see what happens some of these days but i think they're going to change some things around this next year uh not from the scholarship but uh, it's my understanding they're going to change some things around uh the way they uh try to foster new uh, makers into their into their group and they're going to kind of change the dynamic of how they get get everybody involved so I'm anxious to kind of see how that's going to work out. So my goal uh, at some point is to be a member of that group. And uh, I, I go, they have their annual, they, they canceled their show this year because of the uh, virus uh, issues, but uh, uh, they're still going to do some things this next year and uh, get things, keep things moving. Uh, and hopefully they're going to have their show next fall in October. They always have their big, uh, TCAA show over in the city in October and I always go over and see the exhibit and I look at and I'm at, in awe at some of the stuff that they do but then I also sit back and go in my own brain you know you know what I've come a long way and I'm not too far off I just got to keep working at it and maybe one of these days I'll get there so there you go so, yep I was uh, fortunate enough to actually attend that last year as lady in waiting it falls in the same time as the mm -hmm. same appearances in Tulsa for our state title holders and I got to go, and I will give you a disclaimer. Anybody that goes on that's jumpy when their bidding is over for the round, they do an air horn. I'm not a jumpy person. <laughs> However, I do know some people that are, and my lovely teen <laughs> was with me, and they give you a warning that they're going to do it. But hey, then we're going to do an it, air horn. And, just... and yeah. I'm... So it scared the crap out of you. Not me. Oh. My teen, though. I'm oh, not jumpy. Okay. And I the see. whole time, she's like, how did it's, you not jump? Like, you know, one day that's probably so, going right. to hurt me because I'm not a jumpy person, but man, <laughs> disclaimer, yeah. that is a really cool show though. Yeah, it is a cool show. That was show, really, really exciting. Yeah. I met a lot of really wonderful people and learned a lot um, mm -hmm. about things that I never even put into perspective. It's really interesting. Culture. I have a, I have a, I have a little bit of a tie to the, not just that group, but to the, to the museum itself, because if you go to the rodeo section over there in the museum, You'll see, uh, you know, lots of saddles and different cases and lots of different items and whatever on display. And uh, <clears throat> uh, when Larry Mahan, in the Larry Mahan case in the museum, when Larry Mahan won the top hand award saddle, the guy that I learned to build saddles from built that saddle that's in that case. So uh, I have a little bit of a connection to the, to the museum itself and, and some of the things that are going on over there in the rodeo. Uh, uh, section of the of the museum and it's it was really interesting i'll tell you a funny story no, most people don't realize this uh <clears throat> don had a he started at veach saddlery veach made saddlery in trenton missouri when he was 10 and he grew up and he started his own shop when he was 17 in pahuska oklahoma okay he built boots and saddles okay and at some point he moved from pahuska back to uh Trenton, Missouri, and started his own shop, uh, Don Atkinson Saddlery, in Trenton. And uh, he was commissioned, and I was trying to remember what year it was. I can't remember what year it was that Mayhan won, but anyway, he was commissioned to build the top hand saddle that year when he was had his shop in Missouri. So he began building that saddle in Missouri. And you know how a lot of times whenever... Uh, uh, for for instance, uh, and most people like on your on your podcast they won't be able to see, but on the video here, uh, they'll do a pattern, and then down over here in the corner they'll put their maker stamp, mm -hmm. and they'll tie it in with the tooling some way so it kind of makes sense, like kind of like I did here on this. You know, they'll they'll put their maker stamp, and they'll tie it in with the design. Well, he he did this saddle, and he tied his maker stamp, and it says Trenton, Missouri on it, and it says Don Atkins Saddlery, Trenton, Missouri. Uh, and then at some point 
he moved from Trenton, Missouri down to Ingram, Texas before the saddle was finished. And he got a new maker stamp. And so if you look on that saddle, and like I said, most people don't realize this, but I was actually, I sat there for two hours one day and looked at this saddle through the case because I was, you know, I was really curious. And it was, it wasn't really ornate like a lot of the saddles were back then. He did some interesting things and it's just different, but I appreciate all kinds of art and and craftsmanship. But anyway, he had this Veach, or this uh, Don Atkinson saddle, he had his, from Trent, Missouri, he had it in the, in the, the uh, pattern that, he had done and then if you look off in this random spot there's a, a, a Don Atkinson saddlery Ingram Texas just randomly stamped in this saddle outside of the pattern and it doesn't really go with everything else but he finished that saddle in Ingram Texas gotcha. so it's got two different it's 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 got two different stamps on it, maker stamps on it, from the same person in two different places because he started in one place and finished it in another. And then, funny thing is, is Don and Larry were buddies. They were friends because they rodeoed together quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So uh, Don got commissioned to build this saddle, not knowing that Larry is one of his best rodeo buddies was going to win it. So it was really interesting. Uh, kind of a little history lesson there, but something that most people wouldn't pick up on anyway so uh you know that's that's my tie kind of to the museum uh as i build i still have a lot of patterns of dons from when i was in his shop uh, uh i built my saddle and i kept all the pattern set from the very first saddle i ever built but he told me he said uh, before you leave and go home he said i want you to go back there and i want you to take any and every pattern that you want and i want you to trace it and take it home so and that's unusual for somebody just to get to go you know, in somebody else's saddle shop and do, <laughs> you sure. know, Don, Don just didn't give away his stuff. So, uh, but I've got a full set of patterns out of his shop for about everything he built. So, um, awesome. cool stuff, really cool stuff. Yep. So yeah. we were talking, that's the national and Western cowboy heritage museum here in Oklahoma city. Uh -huh. And they are open even with everything going on. They did open back up. Yep. You can go through there and they have a really cool kids section on their website. You can go through and mm -hmm. figure out their dates and times. And they do a lot of shows and yep. they're huge on education. They are huge education on education. for Western way of lifestyle, mm -hmm. rodeo, saddle making, the Texas Cowboy Arts Association, every their traditional. Traditional, right. Yeah. Yep. Anything yep. that you kind of want to learn about, they are really good for that. They are. They are. They're really good about that. Uh, one of the other things that happened with me this year that uh, I don't know, you probably, you may have seen on my uh, Facebook page is um, I had uh, right about the time that all the virus stuff kicked off back in March, uh, April, uh, I had a person contact me here in the shop and because uh, I didn't know what was going to happen here <clears throat> and how the virus stuff was going to affect me. And uh, I was a little bit worried about it because this is what I do and I'm the only one that does it. And so anyway, um, and saddle makers aren't rich. So <laughs> I, I have to keep moving. I have to keep working in order to keep going. So one of the things that I, I worried about was anyway, I, I, had, a, I had one of the local uh, political conservative groups get a hold of me and then they did a story on me and then uh, the president of the group's mom is a reporter here in town for the local paper, and she called me up and said, hey, I'd like to do a story on you and stick it in the local paper, talk about the virus and this and that and, other, and how it may or may not affect your, your business and this and that and the other. And she said, and then, she said, I, I uh, write for several other publications, and I'd like to go ahead and write a long story, uh, a little bit more in-depth story on you personally, and uh, see if uh, one of them bites. And I'm like, okay, so she did. And, they put the one that, in the paper, and it was a really nice story. I really appreciated it, and uh, probably one of the best paper stories ever been done uh, on me uh, in the shop. But uh, I got a I got a call about you know, a month and a, two months ago, I think. She called me and said, "Hey, um, one of the publications picked up your." story and she said you know i told you that they weren't guaranteed that they'd even run your story at all and i said it's really hard to get into and i said yeah really and she said yeah um she said oklahoma hall of fame magazine is gonna run a story on you and i said wow so that like that publication is like just a biannual publication they only do that two times a year and it's really cool so they did a really nice uh, six page spread um 
uh, the Oklahoma Hall of Fame uh, magazine did this really nice six page glossy spread. It's really, really cool magazine, really cool article on me and the shop. And uh, I was pretty, uh, I was, pr I was pretty kind of taken back by that. Was, so that's my local claim to fame here. There you <laughs> uh, go. <laughs> uh, uh, probably the biggest publication I've ever been in. And it, and it meant a lot to me because, uh, you know, like, like she said, they get, not just anybody gets in that, that, that magazine at all. And so I was in there with some other really cool, uh, individuals, uh, another, uh, painter and, and a few other people and some really interesting, uh, things, but that was, that was pretty special for me to be able to have happen even during all this stuff uh, sure. this year. And, uh, so who knows, maybe someday I'll get inducted into that one too, the go. Oklahoma Hall of Fame. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, they're actually down on class and, and 14th in the city, I think somewhere. And it's the, uh, Gaylord, uh, the Gaylord uh, Museum and Oklahoma Hall of Fame. It's just a little place down there and they do things on Oklahoma people. So kind of interesting. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. Kind of a neat achievement for me to be able to have that recognition. So there you go. Yep. Yeah. So anyhow, uh, you know, I, I, I'd encourage people here locally uh, who might hear this, want to come and see me or anybody that wants to come see me. We're usually here from nine to five Monday through Friday and eight to two on Saturdays. And, and so a lot of times I'm here after hours. So, uh, uh, because I have to be and, uh, uh, encourage people to come by and see what we do here. Even if you just want to stop in and say hello, or if you're looking for some information, uh, if you're looking for a saddle, absolutely come and see me. I'd love to help you. Um, I specialize, uh, one of the things I specialize in is, and I don't, this is not my kind of not my deal, but this is kind of where the market led me. But uh, I actually build saddles for gypsy horses, uh, a pretty specific breed of horse, and they have some sp specific uh, saddle fitting issues. So I try to uh, accommodate those, and that probably uh, accounts for about 50% of the saddles that I build, uh, uh, or more actually. Uh, uh, it, it's accounted for almost 90% of the last, over the last six, six or so years of the saddles that I've built. But I build, uh, I'll build ranch saddle, uh, you know, roping, roping saddles, team roping, calf roping, whatever, whatever you want. I don't, I don't, I try not to limit myself to one specific style of saddle simply because I, I feel like I've got a pretty good grasp on what you need out of every type of saddle there is. Uh, even though I haven't competed in those things, I pay attention and I, I try to educate myself on what the needs of uh, specific, you know, uh, event type things are. Uh, but I like to work, I, I built a, a bunch of ranch saddles, a bunch of open saddles and several barrel racing saddles. So <laughs> if you're looking for a really good barrel racing saddle, I can hook you up. Good so. deal. Well, it's been an honor being yep. in your shop and hanging out with you today. Uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've enjoyed having you, and I'd like for you to come back sometime and see us. Be I great. will. And Be then great. I will link your website and Facebook page and everything in my episode notes. Yeah, uh, a website, <laughs> uh, you know, it's cbar 8 saddlerycom I don't have a lot on there. We don't sell anything through the website. If you want something from me, you have to call me up or come into the shop. That's the way I operate. And I, I don't, you know, I just don't sell a lot of stuff through the website because that's not what I do. Um, maybe that's to my own detriment, but that's just not how I operate. Personal contact. Um, it's all <laughs> it's all custom stuff. And when you're talking about custom, I want the customer to be a part of it. There you go. And be more of a personal, uh, you know, intimate one-on-one -on -one type experience. So, uh, and then I've got, again, my Facebook, my personal Facebook page is Clinton M. Hole, H-O-L-E. And then we have C-Bar H Saddlery uh, Facebook page as well. And uh, again, we'd love for you to come in the shop. The phone number here at the shop, yeah, I'll give you that too. Uh, it's 405-494-7780. Uh, I'm usually here again from nine to five uh, every day during the week and eight to two on Saturdays. You know, just call me up and, and uh, come see me or come by. And we're at 316 Elm Avenue here in Yukon, a little a uh, shopping center uh, just south of uh, Main Street, which is 66, uh, Route 66 here in Yukon, uh, between 3rd and 4th, just one block south of, of Main, and a little shopping center here called the Old Mill Plaza. Come down in the corner and see us. We'll 
be around. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Kylie. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh -huh. Bye.